This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 406, recorded on September 9th, 2016. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free. If you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe, this episode is also sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple to use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. We're also giving away copies of the recently published book, Virus, an illustrated guide to 101 incredible microbes by Marilyn Rusink. Keep listening to find out how to enter. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me here today in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Good morning, Vincent. Where it is rather sultry, isn't it? It is summertime again. You know, after that hurricane uh, skirted, uh, it was a little chilly, but now we have 30 Celsius today, and it's only uh, 10.30 a.m. I know. It's doing an early record today. Heavy, uh, hot, and humid. 65% humidity, it's hot. and the air, AC isn't on here. <laughs> right. So we're both sweating. Yep. You have patchwork on your shirt, dude. Thank you. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And uh, the air conditioning is on here. Yes, <laughs> I actually have control over that. But I'm, I'm glad to hear the Hammer building is still up to its usual standard. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and it's it's pretty, it's only 27C here. The dew point's 23. So that's not a whole lot of spread. And it's really sticky and yucky outside. Yeah. People uh, who are thinking about building new science buildings, you know, they do their what we call due diligence, and they look at other buildings and learn from them. And they look at the <laughs> I've got hammer a horrible building. example they can look at. They look no, at the hammer building and say, we're never going to do anything like that. You're the poster child for <laughs> how not to do this. That's right. <laughs> also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's 72 degrees here. Oh, My app says it feels like 72 degrees, but the humidity is 87%. Ouch. And yeah, so it's, it's very like sticky. Walking out into fog. Yeah. yeah. I got I have to admit I love it. I just love it. I need to move somewhere where it's that way. But you guys got rain recently though, didn't you? Uh, we had rain uh, one night. Yeah. We haven't we had haven't any had here. Huh? Cuz they had some flooding had in much. the Midwest. My son lives in Wichita and he that whole area got creamed. Which does he you live in? Last night. Wichita. He lives in Wichita, Wichita Kansas. Kansas. That's Wich way west. You know, no, but the, the the tongue of rain went all the way up into Illinois and into Indiana. Yeah. Also yeah. joining us from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hey, Rich. This is somebody so, who got rain. Uh, we, <laughs> yes. Yeah. As a matter Just of fact, a little bit. Uh, yeah, I was uh, not here last week. Uh, Primarily because I had family in town, but it turned out that that was a good thing because that hurricane blew through. And although it was pretty much over by the time we would have recorded, the power was out. <laughs> but we, uh, you know, we got up to 50 mile an hour winds, as you actually said that on the last show, but not locally. That was out at the airport. So it wasn't all that much rain, you know, a little over three inches or something like that. But it was uh, windy and rainy, and the power was out for about 12 hours. Trees down all over town, but I've seen much worse, and we personally didn't sustain any real damage. So it's all good. And the weather uh, coming in behind that has been gorgeous because I talked to my daughters this morning uh, as they were commuting to their jobs. We had a three-way iPhone chat. was uh, glorious. <laughs> and I had the, the, their Boston and Austin, and I had the best weather. Boston, uh, Austin? The three. <laughs> Boston, Austin, and Gainesville. I had the best weather of the three of them. Sounds now, like a it's, it's always nice after a hurricane blows through. Yeah, I got a it, discrepancy yeah. here because my uh, phone tells me that it's 83 out at the airport. My <laughs> little thermometer here uh, that reads the outside temperature says it's 78. So Let's I'm going to go with temperature. I'm going to go with 78. Uh, which is 25C, humidity 68%, and a dew point of 71 degrees. So that's 
not bad for this time of year. It really feels delightful outside. Right. A little sticky for somebody from, you know, Arizona, but um, uh, it's nice. It's good. Sunny. It's good. Cool. Little follow up. Our friend Anthony writes, it's great that there are companies supporting your fine shows. I don't quite understand people who are unhappy with the ads because the format of the shows is academic. Are the disgruntled upset by what, by what they see as commercial interruptions of a lecture? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for some lectures, a commercial interruption would be welcome. <laughs> right, it would wake them up. <laughs> you clearly state that the messages are for sponsors. There's no need for jingles for the audience to know that it's paid advertising. Are promotions not proper for historical records? <laughs> Nobody expects TV, radio, or the papers to become charities on those rare days when they don't make up the news. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, by the way, so last time we had an email lamenting uh, that you know, like special episodes like the D. A. Henderson one, which have some historical value, are interrupted by commercials. So I emailed the ad agency I work with, and. Uh, the head there, she said, no, you don't have to put ads on specials because they're not covered by the ad contract. So I will remove the ads from our D.A. Henderson episode. I'll put up a new episode so that, you know, in the future, if someone wants to listen to it, they won't be interrupted by ads. Cool. So that, that's good. So special twivs don't need ads, only the numbered ones. Four a month, that's what we contracted, four twivs and all the others as well. And do we respond to our audience or what? Yeah, yes, we do. I, we are very responsive. I think we have the best audience in the world. We have really dedicated people who write in. I think this is really engagement beyond most shows. Well, and, and if you go back to early episodes, we used to to be Fahrenheit degree stalwarts. Mm -hmm. um, true. That's true. For example, <laughs> that's true. But now yeah, we, there, we can change. There are people who don't like the weather, and I understand that. Yeah. Hey, but you know what? There's on every podcast player. There is a skip forward 30 second button. <laughs> and that's specially made for the weather. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there, ought to be a skip, I, it, there ought to be a skip forward five minutes one for our podcast, right? <laughs> well, I just, I just checked. I, I was noting what time we started recording and what time we finished up with the weather. It was almost exactly five minutes of weather. <laughs> it's not bad. So out of an hour and a half, ideally bad. hour and a half podcast, that's not bad at all. And in some cases, weather affects the transmission of viruses. So it's it's good to sure. know what's yes. going on. Listen, there's at least five minutes of weather out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I get weather all day. We had uh, three entries in the first contest to win a copy of viruses. Now we know um, how many people listen all the way to the end. <laughs> I don't know either that the or <laughs> they don't want the book or it's too cheap and they just buy it. They don't want to, I don't know, it could be a lot of reasons, but we do appreciate the three. Uh, the first is from Kim. Alan, why don't you read that one? Sure. Kim writes, my dark and misanthropic entry to the virus competition. You can probably figure out which virus I'd like to be. Quote, the earth is ill and I am the cure. Born and raised in poultry markets in Asia, I would get to travel the world with my segmented RNA genome. During my travels, I would treat the earth, I would treat the earth from the pest that is humans. Knowledge obtained from gain-of-function studies would have predicted my arrival. Luckily, <laughs> humans objected to such studies. Preventive measures obtained from developing a universal vaccine against me would have spared many. Luckily, humans preferred to fund research into hoverboards. Humans might view me as evil and depict me as one of the four horsemen of the uh, apocalypse, yet I'm one of the finest creations of Mother Nature and the savior of the Earth. I've restored the balance and brought peace to Earth, and to the creatures left to inhabit this planet, I will be God. I've rid the Earth from its disease. <laughs> Whoa, that is dark. Interesting. You know, yes. <laughs> uh, Dixon, you should take the next one. I'll take one. the next one. I, I, I have trouble reading, so this one is a natural for me. Uh, Abraham Herp writes, herpes simplex. Isn't the reason obvious? Mm. That's good. Pretty Ka sexist, uh, wouldn't you say? Kathy, can you take the last one? Um, sorry, I was doing some other research <gasps> uh -oh. for later in the uh -oh. show. Uh -oh. Yes, yes, here we go. Uh, Rye hat? Rayon. Is that how you would say it? Ryan? Okay. Every time that a word begins with B, it's capitalized in uh, Hebrew. Actually, so, more than that, every B in the whole thing is capitalized. <laughs> yeah, no, every every B is capitalized, not just the ones that begin the words, right. So, but I, I, I can't really read it that way, but 
Anyway, <laughs> which virus I'd like to be? Question mark. It's blatantly obvious. Influenza B, the bug that began my scientific journey. This is a virus so ubiquitous that most of us would have been infected by it before puberty. <laughs> a virus that has been ignored for way too long. That only recently has it been decided to include a second strain in the biennial vaccine, a virus that the honorable Peter Palazzi said could be obliterated because of an absence of an animal reservoir, unlike its more often studied sibling, the boisterous influenza A, which infects every breathing mammal and over embellishment. But still, this virus busies itself around infecting every baby and elderly. Some argue that the blueprint to a universal influenza vaccine can be found in the motifs conserved in influenza B, at least in the conserved bits with influenza A. <laughs> Inspired by TWIV, I once asked my supervisor, do you think viruses are alive? He replied, I think viruses just be. Parentheses, nice. <laughs> true story. <laughs> So and then and he's got uh, a, he's got yeah he's got a footnote he's got an footnote. asterisk uh, that because of the absence of an animal reservoir has an asterisk, um, and he cites publications by Osterhaus at all have shown that influenza B has been recovered in seals off the coast of the Netherlands, but it's probable <laughs> that the seals got it from us rather than the other way around. <laughs> Best right. regards, Ryan. All right, we have I, well these, yes, go ahead, Rich. I think <laughs> Kathy did a fine job. That was beautiful. With these, yes, yeah, that was great. That was nice good. Job. Great <laughs> emphasis. Yeah. All right, we have all decided that Raihan is the winner here. Yes. So, Raihan, please send me an email. Uh, tell me where to send your book. We're going to have another contest beginning today, and uh, I will announce it somewhere randomly through the rest of the episode. I, no. I, you know, I'm sorry to make you listen. <laughs> <laughs> but if it turns out that, you know, 20,000 people download our episodes, but three listen, that's sad. <laughs> that's not true. Uh, well, we and and we should know we we are actually aware that it's kind of ballooned to to beyond one hour and a half, and we're we're, we're going to try and work on it. Yeah, we're going to try and keep it to ten minutes. So goodbye, everybody. That's it. <laughs> All right, this episode you. you've been listening to. Yeah. That's right. That's right. This we have the weather. We have a brief Zika update. Uh, Rich pulled up a lovely page from the Florida Department of Public Health. They have a daily Zika update. This is terrific. Yep. We hey. should have had this. A long time ago. This comes from Tallahassee, and they're providing a daily update uh, on the case count. Travel-related infections as of September 7th, 596. Non-travel-related infections, 56. These are locally acquired. And infections involving pregnant women, 80. Now, those 80, do you think those are mainly the uh, travel-related? They don't break it down? Uh, I would, uh, if, if I just uh, work the numbers on this, I would guess that 90% of them are travel-related. Because ninety percent right. of the infections are travel related. Are travel related, but the, pre yep. the ones involving pregnant women. That's what I'm saying. I'll, right. bet, if you, so I'll bet you there's uh, one, you know, seventy two travel related uh, pregnant women okay. with infected with Zika and if another eight yeah, something okay. like that. Right. Anyway, it's a good it's going good on site, the odds. and we'll put a link in the show notes as usual. You can check that out. As you, as we talked about last time. Um, in fact, Congress did vote not to give, not to pass the bill, uh, giving money to Zika research uh, because of the Planned Parenthood provisions. Because uh, the uh, Republicans did not want to give Planned Parenthood any money to be able to distribute condoms to prevent sexual transmission. So I think the Democrats decided to nix the bill. And as well, I think it was actually worse than that. They yeah, were actually de defunding. They were they wanted to remove all federal funding from Planned Parenthood, which, you know, we're we're basically at this point where um it, there's already a prohibition in the law that Planned Parenthood cannot uh use government funding to provide abortion services. Yeah. Which is the crux of the Republican objection to them. So really all these debates about Planned Parenthood and oh, we want to defund them. Uh, they're holding up these budgets and such for for things like Pap smears. It's unfortunate so. that uh, so basically, as we said last time, uh, the CDC is running out of money for Zika. That's so that they can yep. help diagnose and help do mosquito control, etc. Uh, NIAID has been developing vaccines. They're running out of money, and it's absurd that it should fall prey to politics. And I think the main reason is that nobody in Congress thinks that this is a big deal in the U.S. 
and so they're not so urgent about it. You That's know, eventually, eventually, there, I know people in Florida do. They Dixon. think it's an enormous yes. deal, but uh, not elsewhere. That's and true. Um, yeah. in fact, it's not going to spread extensively as yep. it has in other countries. But I think that's the wrong approach. We need to. This is going to be a travel related vaccine for especially pregnant women who want to travel to endemic areas right. and it needs to be developed. Plus, why can't we do research and development of therapeutics that will help the whole world, not just us? Why do we have this narrow view of uh, infection in the U.S.? It makes no sense to me whatsoever. But uh, we are a centric country, unfortunately. That's something I don't like, and that such is such is the way it is. This is my opinion and not those of my uh, co-hosts here. Well, my yeah, my opinion is why can't we just legislate instead of you know doing this stupid stuff? Okay, let's vote on a bill about funding the Zika research. Okay, without. Uh, cluttering it up with a bunch of stuff that is irrelevant to the bill itself. A dirty, that a is, dirty bill. <laughs> that is not the current way Washington is. I, I understand. I and understand. I, yeah, I, why, why can't we do that? That is a darn fine question. <laughs> yeah. I'm on board with that too. Yeah. Ditto. Uh, Anthony, who uh, we wrote, read his letter above, um, who is here in New, uh, across the river in New Jersey, I should say, he sent the link. I don't. He sent an email. I don't have the link to it. I'll put it in the show notes later. But he sent an article. Uh, New Jersey Senate Democrats released this Vitale bill to fight Zika virus clears committee legislation sponsored by Senator Joseph Vitale providing Medicaid coverage for services to treat and prevent Zika infections and other health concerns associated with the virus cleared the Senate Health Human Services and Senior Citizens Committee today. So that's a New Jersey a committee of the New Jersey State Senate. So we'll see what happens to that. Uh, it cleared the committee eight nothing. It will now head to full Senate for further consideration. So we'll let you know what happens there. As I said, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. A uh, couple of other things. A, a very brief article in uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases ahead of print. Culex pipiens and 80s triceriatus mosquito susceptibility to Zika virus. This is work done out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison asking whether those mosquitoes can transmit uh, infection. And I, it's a very brief, it's basically a little, it's a letter to the editor. But they, they basically, I believe what they do is they infect uh, mice and then they let mosquitoes feed on them and they ask uh, if you can transmit the virus to another mouse with those mosquitoes. Uh, and essentially, the Culex uh, mosquitoes are negative for a virus. They don't pick up and transmit virus to other mice. The Aedes triceriatus mosquitoes are susceptible when exposed to mice with the highest viremia concentration, but they don't spread the virus to other mice. Right. Dixon, what's the significance of this? Well, they're both very common mosquitoes throughout the East and the Midwest, and so you'd be concerned as to whether or not they okay. can act as a further vectors. And the triceriatus is a treehole mosquito breeder. Uh, that bite you in the early afternoon, and you wonder where the hell are those mosquitoes coming from anyway? And they're coming from the trees that have these big holes in them that are put there by woodpeckers and things like that. So, or if you're in a, a less um, uh, natural place, they're coming from any little container. Yeah, exactly. They bite you in the early afternoon. They do. That's when they start. Uh, and Culex, then through through the night. Culex is the mostly. Through I thought the they night. bit you in the arm. <laughs> uh. Dixon. Yeah, Culex is, ex, is an extremely common nuisance mosquito. If yeah. you're outside in the U.S. and you get bitten by a mosquito, there's a really good chance it's Culex pipiens. Yeah. Um, they bite during the day. No, 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 that's a night feeder. Tri that's Culex, a night feeder. Culex pipiens is a night feeder. Uh, Triceriatus right. is a mid after. What, uh, what is 80s Egypti? That's a, it's a dawn and, uh, and uh, dusk. Crepuscular. Crepuscular. So yes. 80s Egypti, we call peridomestic, yes. uh, is also right. Triceriatus peridomestic? It is, but it's mostly a woodland mosquito because of the opportunities for breeding in this okay. uh, area. I love that. And also, also because um, <laughs> Triceriatus, I think, has a, has a preference for animals. Here, here. Over, well, we are over we are animals. We, we are animals, are. but we don't we don't smell as good to them as squirrels and chipmunks and and, and what the, have you. the behavior of the Senate confirms that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. All right. Now, uh, an article 
came out this week. At any rate, the bottom, the bottom line from this is that these other mosquitoes are unlikely to be vectors for Zika. Correct. 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 Right. Is that a fair statement? It is. Yes. Even right. under laboratory situations, it's difficult. Right. Now, coulisine spread West Nile, right, Dixon? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. But so do we. Yes, of course. All right. Uh, and one more thing on Zika. A paper came out in Cell Reports uh, this week. And it is called Zika virus infection in mice causes pan-uveitis with shedding of virus in tears. Mm. It's from a group at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, Colorado State University. The first author is Jonathan Miner. Last author is Rajendra, Rajendra Apt. And there, There's a co-first author, too, Abdullah Sene. Oh, dear. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't even Corrected look at it. I don't even look at that. That just shows what a dinosaur I am. And <laughs> buried in this paper is um, Michael Diamond, actually second to last author. He's actually designated as lead contact, whatever lead that contact, means. Something new. Hey, he's, journals, he's invite, invent new write. things. Go ahead, invent new things all the time. <laughs> Wonderful. Take our work and reinvent stuff. Thank you. <laughs> just make us well, look I, more I, like dinosaurs. That's this all. is more. No, this is actually, my opinion. A lot of this, most of it, actually comes from the researchers themselves, the co-first author yeah, thing, right. yeah. it grows straight out of lab politics. That's not something the journals came up with. What and lead, lead contact, contact. I'm, it's probably something similar, like, okay, this person's going to be senior author, but uh, Michael Diamond's the one you should really talk to about the oh, paper. come I, on, people. So I guess it's like co-senior <laughs> author. Grow up. What's wrong with corresponding author? Next, we're going to designate somebody rear admiral, and somebody will be quarterback. In and, fact, you, you know. could you could contact anybody on this paper. Just find their you email could. and write them an email. That's this is the world of social media. You don't need this yeah. antiquated yeah. stuff. All right. So this paper utilizes a mouse model that the Diamond Laboratory has previously published, and which we talked about, and that is using uh, immunosuppressed mice, either which lack the receptor, the gene encoding the receptor for type one interferons so-called IFNAR null mice, IFN, interferon A receptor, null, a type A receptor binds type 1 and 2 interferons, or they can give the mice antibodies to interferons to suppress them, and then these mice get infected and the virus multiplies effectively. And this paper they shows that, in fact, can replicate in the eye, can be shed in tears, uh, and that's very interesting. But what I really want to focus on uh, is the fa- one part of this paper uh, where they use uh, double knockout mice, which not only, or sorry, they use mice that lack uh, a number of genes, but one of them is Axel, AXL, uh, a gene encoding a protein that has been suggested quite often to be uh, required for entry of the virus into cells. And they, they suppress, uh, they give these animals uh, antibodies to uh, IFNAR, anti IFNAR monoclonal antibodies. I guess they didn't want to make a double knockout right away because that's, right. that's expensive. So you might as well find out first if, if the axle null mice do anything. Okay, so if axle is a receptor for Zika virus, you would send, say that in null mice lacking the gene, there should be no virus replication. But in fact, in a variety of tissues, uh, including the eyes, um, uh, there's just as much virus uh, as wild-type mice. So the eyes have it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I've been a little disturbed by all of the work on Axel and, and related receptors in the past few months. Last year, in, in 2015, a JV paper suggested that Axel and related proteins might be a receptor, but no one had ever done a definitive experiment, which is mm-hmm. either clone the gene encoding Axel, put it in cells that don't have it, and show that it confers susceptibility, knock out the gene. And um, th- this is important, in mice at least, if you take out the axle gene, it, they can still be infected. And we would like to see this in cells, of course, as well, and I'm sure that'll come. But so many times, these these research papers, people look in tissues, say, oh, there's lots of axle here, you know, that's important. And then the press picks that up, and I remember writing to a journalist some time ago, I said, don't say that axle is the receptor. It's suggested, but it hasn't been proven yet. And now here, we, I think this is good evidence that it's probably not, at least in mice. So we'll see. Well, but, it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it shows that at least in this is a highly artificial system, but it shows at least in some contexts you can you can still uh, keep rolling without an axle, so to speak. You can keep rolling without an axle. Okay, that's right. all I wanted to point out about this. Does yeah. any anyone have anything else? Uh, um, two things. First of all, uh, I'm sorry, Kathy. Go ahead. 
Well, I, I was just going to say, I went to a seminar yesterday by the uh, final author on this. I, he's not the lead author, but he's the um, <laughs> ophthalmologist type person. Um, and uh, I can't remember whether you said it in the seminar, but they definitely write it in the paper that, you know, Axel might still act as an entry factor uh, for other uh, tissue compartments like trophoblasts right. in the placenta or maybe subsets of neurons in the central nervous system. Um, and then um, this was a seminar over in the Kellogg Eye Center. And um, so it was really pretty much focused on uh, all the eye things that are uh, shown here in the paper. There wasn't any particular new piece of data that I saw yesterday. Um, they they did do and they did see more uh, pathogenesis, uh, more severe ocular pathology um, uh, with virus that had already been grown in mice, and I can't remember whether it was specifically a virus that was recovered from the eye. And those were a different immune knockout mouse, the AG129 mice. Mm. Uh, yeah, they were when they were inoculated with eye homogenates, they got more severe ocular pathology. So they wondered whether there was some kind of adaptation to the eye, um, and they uh, did some experiments that tend to rule that out, but they also did uh, massive sequencing and found a large increase in the frequency of a particular nucleotide mutation in the NS2A um, uh, gene. And um, they, I, I asked if they've had a chance to look and compare viruses with and without that mutation for pathogenesis, and they're doing that now. So that was kind of interesting. So remember, uh, one of the original features of uh, Zika virus infection, not only rash and joint pain, but conjunctivitis is part of it as well. So right. Right. And, humans, right? And right. Uh, Conjunctivitis is not the same as uveitis. So the uveitis that they're reporting here is much more severe. Yep. So uh, check me on this. Make sure I got this right. I think that uh, the, the main thrust of this paper is that one of the congenital problems that comes up in a Zika infection in a pregnant woman uh, is infections in the eye and yes. uh, consequences from that. So this paper is an attempt to reproduce that in an animal model so that it can be studied further. And what they find is they can inf infect the eyes on these uh, immunocompromised mice, but they uh, at the same time find that they can't reproduce they can't show a congenital transmission right. correct. Of, of, correct. of Zika virus. Right. So it's a, it's a model that shows you can infect the eyes so that it works from that point of view, but you can't reproduce the uh, congenital bit. I think a lot but, of the congenital that, defects that were observed are uh, neurological in origin. Mm -hmm. And, and also, also that they, that they can't uh, observe the, the um, neurological defects or the, the eye ocular defects um, congenitally because they because the pups die yeah. you know yeah. so they or, right. or or die when they're still embryos so or fetuses so um it, it doesn't say that it doesn't happen it's just that they can't but they didn't all die they had an experiment where some were born and they didn't have virus in them uh, they infected them later i think yeah. uh, they infect to, neonates to avoid that. yeah or eight day old mice yeah so. Uh, and am I correct that one of the reasons that Axel has been so attractive as a potential receptor is that it's, it's abundant in neurological tissues? It's in a lot of or is it all, it's all over the place. It's all over okay. the place, but it you know goes back to this JV paper in 2015 where they okay. overproduce it and you know you get enhanced replication, right. but it's not certainly not enough. Okay, I want right. I want to tell you about a sponsor of this show, Curiosity Stream. They are a streaming service, so you basically can watch movies or documentaries. Uh, and it was founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel, and so it's nonfiction. It's all supposedly fact, or it tries to be fact. Uh, and it's the first ad-free nonfiction streaming service in the world. There are no ads. You buy a subscription. Uh, and then you watch them, which which I like. I think it's nice not to have ads, right? But if there are ads, I listen to a lot of podcasts with ads. I don't skip over them. 
You have over 1,500 titles, 600 hours of content. You can get it on many, many platforms. You can watch it on the web or on your devices like Apple TV, Amazon, Kindle, Chromecast, uh, iOS, your, your iPhone, Android device, your Roku. And they have uh, it's available in 196 countries and... They have a wide variety of science and technology content, history, nature, interviews, lectures, things that the listeners of TWIV might like. And that's why I thought this would be a good fit for our audience. Their library includes Stephen Hawking's universe, where he traces the history of astronomical theories and technologies, uh, deep time history, the history of the 14 billion years of the universe, underwater wonders of the national parks. It's a hunt there. The National Park Service of the U.S., 100 years old this year. John uh, Dixon, do you know who founded the National Parks? What was his name? John Muir. He helped found them. one of them. One of them. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah, he was big on it, too. Anyway, this series, it's seven parts, take you under the bodies of water in the National Parks. Just make sure you put on your breathing mask. (laughs) One of the largest- (laughs) Or come up for air, one of those- Nonfiction 4K libraries on the internet. Over 50 hours of this high, super high definition content. They have monthly and annual plans available. They start at $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee, or the cost of a single title on some of the competing platforms. So check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up, and you'll get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIV. And I, I suggest you go check it out because if lots of people come from TWIV and check it out, Curiosity Stream will go, wow, they have a lot of listeners and they <laughs> listen to the podcasters. So we're going to take more ads out on their service. We have a paper now for you published recently in Science. It's called Replication of Human Noroviruses in Stem Cell-Derived Human Enteroids. And this comes from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Uh, Now, do we have two first authors or one? I don't want to make the same mistake. Yes, (laughs) these authors contributed Contributed equally equally. to this work. Three Three first authors. Three first authors. Mm Mm-hmm. Etayebi Crawford and Murakami. Those are the first. But all the authors are above average. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) The the corresponding author, uh, to use an old term, is Mary K. Estes, who is a well-established virologist who I have known for many years, and all of us know, except Dixon probably. That's true. I've met her many times. But I'm Uh, sure I would enjoy meeting her. I don't think I've met her Personally, I've seen her work, but haven't certainly seen her work. I don't think she's going to be at the needle meeting. I don't remember if she's on the list. She might be. Take a look at the list. Maybe she's on the list. Yeah, I can bring up the list, which I I finally got around to looking at off the email. So this uses what they call enteroids. Now, we talked about a three-dimensional intestinal model for virus infection a while ago on TWIV 367. That was Carolyn Coyne's model. Actually, Carolyn Coyne and Coyne Drummond, two coins. That's right. They use a 3D intestinal model. They didn't call them enteroids, though, right? I don't recall. No. Organoids. They may have called them organoids. organoids. organoids, So it can be any organ and organoid. Enteroid is specifically from the small intestine. Is that correct? Yes. Right, and colonoids are from the colon. Interesting. All right, so. And asteroids are from beyond Mars. Yes. Ah, I like that. That's right. <laughs> and what other oid word do we have? Anything else? Well, there's hemorrhoids. No, oh, come on. <laughs> Those are <laughs> you <right>. asked. <laughs> you walk right that <laughs> Anything else? Sit on it. <laughs> what else? Steroids. What? Steroids. Steroids. All right. So, what is the root oid? Android. Mean? Android. Android. What is the root? What is the root uh, an- of oid mean? Does anyone know? Yeah. Like it probably means like. All right. Well, yeah. basically, these uh, enteroids. Uh, are made from uh, human stem cells that you get from the intestinal crypts. Isn't that amazing? In the human intestine. And you can differentiate them to form enteroids, which are complex. They're not just a single cell. They're made up of multiple they're cell gut, types. They're gut cells. Right? But they're, you know, they're floating around or uh, they're three-dimensional. 
Uh, they have enterocytes, goblet cells. Uh, enter- cells of paneth. Paneth. What do the paneths do? They secrete hormones, yeah. which has something to do with digestion. Uh, endocrine cells. They can grow them in three dimensions, whereas monolayer cultures. And so they've asked. Yes, go ahead. Right. So I just want to be really specific about this when they in this paper, because they are using monolayer cultures, they call them HIEs, which stands for human intestinal enteroids, but they call them human enteroid, uh, human intestinal mm-hmm. enteroid monolayer cultures. Right. So they're not using a 3D thing right. here. I think what they do is monolayers. they establish the 3D cultures, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they, uh, if they want to set up a monolayer culture, they take a bunch of those 3D guys and disaggregate them uh, with trypsin and plate them uh, in wells as a monolayer. And uh, the, uh, the keeping this right involves a, it's it seems to me two things. First is matrigel, which is a protein uh, matrix that uh, at least in some ways resembles the extracellular matrix that cells ordinarily experience, and that's important for all of this. And there's matrigel both in the 3D culture and in the monolayers. Uh, And two, a really complex and well-worked-out growth medium that has all kinds of factors in it and stuff that maintains the differentiated form of these. Mm -hmm. So you can take the the 3D cultures and disaggregate them and play them out as a monolayer, and they show that you have all these cell types in the monolayer as well. They maintain their differentiated states. Interesting. I just want to point out in the, in the introduction to this paper, it's published in Science, as I said. They say, the lack of a reproducible culture system for human noroviruses has remained the major barrier to achieving a full mechanistic understanding of their replication, stability, antigenic complexity, and evolution. An in vitro culture system is critical, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, this ignores the previous work showing that B cells can be infected with human noroviruses, which we talked about uh, some time ago on TWIV, the work from yes. Stephanie Karst at the University of Florida, Christian Volbus at the University of Michigan. And um, I don't understand why it's not referenced in the introduction. It's, it's mentioned later on, but should really be in the introduction of this paper. Well, there is a reference to some of that work in the introduction, a rather dismissive reference. No, there's nothing uh, in the introduction here. Uh, yeah, where is uh, it? Where you're you're looking at the abstract. The the no, intro. I'm not looking paper. at. I know what an introduction is. It's not <laughs> the abstract. <laughs> but, but this highly offensive sentence: previous reports of possible cultivation systems have not been reproduced okay, or support there. limited replication of a single strain. Yeah, well, that's not that's, what I mean. That's, right? in the that's not what I mean. I, they should say there have been previously uh, reported B cells susceptible. And so, yes. what's different about what we're doing? Why don't we exactly. just come right out forward and say it, folks? I don't really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is a good paper, and it's good work, and it's interesting, and it really bothered me that they felt the need to try to dismiss prior art on this, um, rather than letting the, par- the paper just stand on its own merits. And in fact, that uh, permeated social media, because over on Twitter, everyone was all abuzz and saying how great it was, and I went in and I said, look, let's not forget the B-cell system. It's there also, and it works, yeah. you know. One is- and, that, and that buzz all traces to um, the original paper. Um, you know, uh, you're, you're, you initially blamed media for distorting this, I think, <laughs> and, and I jumped all over you for that. That's because, right. You're uh, there to defend media. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of my roles. Um, medium one uh, I mean, I'll, I'll attack them when they're wrong, but... <laughs> In this case, the only the only things you could even call news stories that I can find online about this are from aggregator sites that are just basically automated systems that reprint press releases. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no actual journalism going into those. Uh, this was not picked up by any of the major report you know sources. I don't think Science did a news article about it. I don't. Yeah, I don't think anybody did an actual news article where they interviewed relevant people. And of course, if they had, one of the first people you'd be calling is yeah, <laughs> Stephanie right. Karst. Um, and uh, and so the the press release and well, the paper initiated this. Then the press release amplified on it by starting off with this notion that, you know, we've known about norovirus, but we've been unable to study it because there's no culture system for it and just really put it in stark terms. And this is the first time we've had a culture system for this virus. And this opens up all kinds of possibilities and yada, 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 which is totally over the top and wrong. 
Um, but I think that originates not so much in the PR office at Baylor as in the lab. And I, I, as I say, I haven't met Ariestes personally, uh, and I don't know if this is a one-off uh, error or if this is part of a pattern of behavior, but this, this is just not really a very nice approach. The uh, the offend the offending sentence uh, has at least relative to the published uh, material two incorrect statements. Uh, it says previous reports of possible culture systems have not been reproduced. That's not true. They have been. It's published uh, or support limited replication. Uh, that's not true. They've gotten replication in the B cell system that is as robust as the replication that is uh, reported here. So it's just not. Correct. And there's a third flaw in that. I, I just want to comment on this with, with a little bit of uh, factual information. So this paper manuscript was submitted in February, and it was accepted in August, meaning that in between time, the authors would have had time to update references to other reports. And so uh, previous reports have not been reproduced. As I believe Rich said, that work has been published. I'm not sure when it fell chronologically relative to the submission and the mm. resubmission and acceptance. Um, and then the um, limited support of replication of a single strain. Um, some of those things uh, have been talked about at meetings. For instance, at the Khaleesi norovirus meeting in Germany in March, uh, Stephanie Karst uh, presented data that... Um, uh, what, what, oh, shoot. I lost it. Um, multiple strains? Data. Uh, well, I'll move on to uh, multiple strains, right, on multiple strains of virus. And then in uh, April, I was at a meeting that she was at in uh, the Southeast Regional Virology meeting, serve C in Atlanta. And right up front, she mentioned the Estes work because that work had been talked about at public meetings, such as one at the University of Michigan. Um and right up front, she mentioned this other work. Um, but Stephanie also pointed out that there's now growth of norovirus in primary B cells. And um, in ASV, she talked about the growth in primary B cells. And she also, again, talked about this other strain, the G217 strain in the B cells. So in the intervening time, there were reports on reproducibility, um, other strains uh, of virus, Mm -hmm. and so there's other a possibility kinds of here that science so, could actually put these as an addition later on as a won't. correction. I blame no. science. I blame science because I'm sure they could. The reviewers I'm, I'm said they could, but they I bet the reviewers not. said put this in and they didn't. I blame science. All right, and yeah. shame on you for not putting this and in I, the introduction. I have, I have two additional objections to this this notion. The previous reports have not been reproduced. First of all, it's an insinuation. Um, if you're going to say something hasn't been reproduced, I, I think that implies that somebody tried and failed. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you if it hasn't been reproduced because nobody's tried yet or you don't know, then you don't say it. Because, you know, a lot of work has not been reproduced, but it's perfectly good. And secondly, talking about things that have not been reproduced, this is brand new work you're publishing on enteroids, isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. Who's reproduced it? So if that's the bar we're setting, then the paper doesn't clear it itself. So it's just, it is just really a gratuitous and incorrect swipe at other work in the field, and I, and I think yeah. it's really ugly. I hate to say this, but I'm older than everybody on this broadcast right now, and I can we tell you, yeah, and I can tell you that I've been listening to to uh, repercussions like this all my life. Uh, it's not new that people not. leave out the important sure. references that tend to diminish their own findings. And I was at a meeting once in Montreal where someone rushed out of a lecture that I couldn't go to because I myself was lecturing at the same time. And on the topic, this guy says, someone just said that you didn't do such and such and you just gave a paper on it. <laughs> yeah, it happens all the time. So, uh, duh, but, uh, <laughs> happens all the time. But uh, it does science happen all is the done by people. That doesn't excuse yeah. it. This that is true. No, no excuse. That's definitely right. Well, it's it reminds me of something we've said before that, you know, extraordinary absolute claims need <laughs> yes. extraordinary absolute right. support. So I want to point out that uh, at the heart of this is what I would call a controversy about what the actual uh, site in vivo of norovirus replication yes. is. Okay. Um, and this is sort of sets up this paper uh, and, and this whole problem because noroviruses cause uh, – uh, gastroenteritis. Okay, so um, 
Boy, do that. Di- diarrhea. <laughs> and the, the uh, obvious assumption is that the virus must replicate in epithelial cells in the gut. But that's been very difficult to demonstrate uh, in biopsies and et cetera. Uh, you don't see much pathology of the epithelium. It's very difficult or, or impossible to find uh, evidence of virus infection of epithelial cells. Now, there's actually one paper from the Estes lab uh, that shows uh, replication in epithelial uh, tissue in biopsies from uh, immunocompromised uh, individuals. Uh, uh, who have a uh, chronic uh, norovirus uh, infection, and that's and that's pretty recent. How much uh, did that suck? Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> on top of this, yeah. sorry. Continue. Uh, yeah. On top of this, there has been so some people like uh, the Karsh lab have looked for alternate targets, uh, and in fact, there's a mouse norovirus uh, that's very similar to the human norovirus, and in the mouse system, uh, it can be shown clearly that a major target of replication is immune cells, including uh, 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 dendritic cells. Uh, macrophages, I believe, and B cells. And this is one of the things that prompted uh, the Karsh lab to investigate the possibility that uh, B cells were a target of replication. And by the way, what we haven't mentioned is that a cofactor in that infection is enteric bacteria, which makes it even uh, more uh, more interesting. Uh, I, I should say on top of this that in the uh, Estes paper where they uh, were able to demonstrate infection of epithelial cells in immunocompromised individuals, they also observed uh, replication in immune cells, uh, dendritic cells, macrophages, and T cells. Uh, they didn't see uh, replication in B cells, but they didn't see any B cells. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, this is... Uh, still, the jury's still out here, okay? So we have a, an in vitro culture system uh, that is supported by some in vivo evidence in a mouse model, and I would say to some extent in the human model that you can get replication uh, in immune cells. And we have this paper that we're going to discuss uh, that for the first time uh, gives evidence of a culture system with uh, replication in um, epithelial cells, in enteric cells. So... Uh, we need to go forward with both of these things. Let me also yeah. add to the argument here because right. I spent all of my adult life studying a parasite that spends part of its life, at least in the enterocytes, in the small intestine, Trichinella adults. And if you look at the enterocyte production in a gut tract, the epithelial cells last about seven days. And each cell of the villus is a different age. So if you make a standing culture from enterocytes, and it's not, it's not differentiating. Are those mature enterocytes? Are those two-day-old, three-day-old, five-day-old? It could be that the virus does infect one of those age groups, mm. and you'd never see it on a standing culture of epithelial cells because they're all mature. So that's a very difficult situation. This is a major advance because you've now finally got all the cell types in the gut together coordinating their efforts. And so that's why this paper, I think, is very interesting. I would love to have had this system for my own purposes, to look at uh, how this parasite actually invades the gut tract. And so it's, it's the next step towards understanding really what happens. It's totally uh, in flux. Imagine how much DNA each one of us sheds into our gut tract every day, considering that every enterocyte lives only seven days and then is shed. Mm-hmm. There's That's DNA an, everywhere. It's an enormous influx <laughs> of stuff down into the large intestine. One thing I'd like to just kind of summarize what Rich was saying is that I think it we have evidence now that multiple cell types are infected in vivo, multiple cell types are yes. infected yeah. in vitro. And then as we'll go through this paper, we'll find out that you know this particular cell culture system and the B cell culture system aren't giving overwhelming humongous amounts of virus, and so they both probably need yeah. – further refinement and right. this paper and the b-cell work give uh opportunities sure. to sure. expand all on right that. so we have Those these monolayer both. cultures derived from these enteroids they infect them with uh the g2.4 noroviruses which are major strains globally um they can see increases in genome by rt-pcr by 96 hours post-infection the um 
the infections were done in using fecal filtrates, right? So filtrates of people with norovirus infection, and there's no bacteria in it. So in this system, uh, replication uh, of norovirus doesn't require uh, bacteria. They tried lipopolysaccharide, which I think was added uh, in the Karst paper and stimulated replication, but that does not promote replication here. Um, they look at the growth characteristics in terms of cytopathic effects, the production of, of viral antigens, the kinetics of infection in this culture system. Of course, if they gamma irradiate the stool filtrate, there's no viral replication. They can detect viral proteins, including structural proteins, enzymes, as well as viral RNA. Uh, in these cultures, they increase uh, over time, uh, and they look at where the, uh, the virus is replicating um, by flow cytometry against viral protein, and they say only the enterocytes uh, were infected. They can actually see virus particles uh, in these cultures. Um, I, was, I was wondering if they could purify the enterocytes in some way and just see if those alone, when cultured, would be infected, right? If you needed the other cell types or, or not. There are no B cells in these cultures, right? There are no B cells, right, right, just, right. just the cells that we have But the enterocytes about. do mature in this cell culture, though, yes? So is it an immature, a mature, don't know. late? They don't, exactly. they, don't, they don't address that, so exactly, I don't know. Exactly. All right. So they conclude that from all this, and uh, it, that the infection of these cultures uh, gives you a productive and complete virus replication cycle. Right. And the data are very nice. Very nice. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm convinced. There's no it's problem. It's a really good, it's mm -hmm. a, there's no question. This is, you know, this is a good system. So for this for this one strain, one thing I want to go yeah. back to that yeah, you ahead. said, ah. right, for that uh, you sa said, Vincent, that they you know show that enterocytes are infected and not goblet or enteroendocrine cells, but they didn't rule out some of the other cell types like panath cells or stem cells that might still be in this culture. Well, they say they did, but maybe you don't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> they say HA um, cultures contain well, all I, these cell types, I, but only the I, enterocytes were infected. Well, I guess by the word only, yeah, but right, I guess yeah. we don't see the data. So the other uh, the other important so, feature of this paper that I find very interesting is that bile is a cofactor. Oh, okay, absolutely. so when well, they, that's, yeah, that's so coming up. When next, they look right? at yeah, that's yeah. fine. When they look at different strains, uh, different strains of neuroviruses, G G one one, G two three, G two seventeen, etc., they don't see replication of these viruses unless they add bile. Yep, can be human bile and or yep. bile from a variety of other. Uh, animals as well. So for the uh, for the uninitiated out there, bile is uh, uh, what actually makes bile is stored in the gallbladder. Where's it made? In the liver. 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 Yeah. Made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, mm -hmm. and uh, secreted into the duodenum, I guess. Yeah. Uh, or duodenum, uh, as you would. Duodenum <laughs> when you take a meal, and uh, the major component of bile is uh, bile. bile is uh, more oids. By the way, I looked up oid. More I'll get oids. to it later. Uh, which uh, basically, <laughs> actually, they're sterols. Okay, these are uh, uh, things that have the steroid uh, uh, polycyclic uh, base, polyhydroxy chicken wire. That's they right. look kind of like cholesterol, <laughs> and so they have a uh, a lipophilic uh, and a hydrophilic portion to them, so they act kind of like detergents to emulsify fats exactly. and that kind of stuff. Exactly. It's an important part of digestion. I think it's appropriate that bile is important because this paper raised my bile. Bless raised you. Raised your bile, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we could also say that bile is vile. Uh, or a vial of bile is anyway, lasts so a while. Turns out well, that, well, you know, this virology is a branch of biology. Ooh, yes! I like it. Mm. Or it's not easy being green. <laughs> So they also, anyway. they also see uh, an effect of bile on the original isolate, the G2.4, yeah. and it enhances its replication as well. And they do a series of experiments to determine if the bile is affecting the virus or the cells. They treat them separately, and it has an effect uh, on the, the cells. Not the, Treating virus with bile <laughs> doesn't stimulate the replication, only treating the cells. Yeah. So th they don't really... They don't explore what bile is doing or what the component is. That would be interesting, of course. Uh, I can't sort believe that. that. I mean, because the bile composition of bile is pretty well understood. And I can't yes. believe they didn't immediately go in and try a bunch of different bile salts <laughs> exactly. and combinations. Exactly. And uh, I, I kind of assume right. that That's right. uh, maybe it didn't work or something yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. And it's going to be more complicated than that. It's going to so, be, be some combination of ingredients. Yeah. 
Yeah. So just to add to this, it, in, in the old days, when I was still in the lab, uh, we, we wanted to see whether or not trichinella larvae isolated from muscle tissue and then it has to pass through the stomach. It enters the small intestine. And, and when you digest them in pepsin, all they do in culture is they open and close. They, they're like little C's that sort of try to close that C down into a, like a little tailed O. And they, they only exhibit those two motions. The moment you expose those larvae to bile mm. and digest away a little lipid layer, and now they can receive signals from the outside, they start behaving like worms and they look like snakes. Mm. It's an mm. instant transformation. Yeah, so bile plays a huge role in ecological signaling to pathogens as they enter the small intestine. So, Dixon, some people have their gallbladders removed. They do. So they, they constitutively do. make, they, they bile just, just flows they in? They secrete it all, all day. So all whenever night. you take a meal, then you just put bile in? Well, bile is not as, is, is not as present in a person who's had their gallbladder removed than in, in lower levels. Like you, you and mean? I, yeah, because the gallbladder I wonder is, if you, you could look at people without gallbladders and see if they have a reduced risk. Of norovirus infection. Oh, isn't great that idea. interesting? That'd be a great idea. Oh, yeah. And then if it's true, then everyone will have their gallbladders removed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which can be done laparoscopically very quickly nowadays. Yeah, it you know. sure can. But it might only be a, a factor yeah, for right. certain strains of norovirus, right? Years so. ago, my mother had her gallbladder removed, and her surgeon gave it to me in a jar. No. I said, why do I need this? <laughs> Gee, thanks. I the, other, the other misconception <laughs> is if you have your gallbladder removed, you're not going to gain a lot of weight because your lipids will just pass on through without being absorbed. Yeah. That's not true. Uh, they they look at the sensitivity of the system. They say how many genome equivalents can be detected, and they can f find between 1,200 and uh, 2 times 10 to the 4th genome equivalents. And they say this is nice because now when we see contamination you know, on surfaces or food, we can look for how much infectious virus is there and see if that's a risk, whereas previously we could only use, you know, PCR uh, types of assays. They make enteroids from throughout the small intestines, different intestinal segments, uh, dual yep. deno, jejunal, and ileal yep. intestine se segments. They find that the virus replicates uh, in all parts of the small intestine, as long as they contain enterocytes. Uh, the other issue is... Um, Infection is dependent on uh, histo blood group antigens, and uh -huh. some people uh, don't make the right ones, and they are resistant to infection. Um, an enzyme called fucosyl transferase 2, uh, which transfers fucose to the precursors of the blood group antigens in the GI cells, correlates with susceptibility to these group 2.4 neurovirus. So they made these organoids from secretor, so people who are positive or negative for this enzyme. Um, and they find that um, all secretor-positive uh, jejunal enterocyte cultures, human mm -hmm. HIEs, as Kathy said, supported replication. Uh, G2.4 strains did not infect uh, HIEs generated from secretor negative when assayed at 96 hours, but if you waited a little longer, you could see some replication. So there is an effect of this, um, having this enzyme or not on replication in these cultures. So it's from these outbreaks that occur on board ships. Ships. Where you've got three or 400 or 5,000 people, yeah. and they've all suffered from diarrhea. They don't all suffer from diarrhea. So I wonder what the breakdown is in terms of susceptible versus non-susceptible. Not, I'm sure the well, data are out of, there. This is one of the things, but not, yeah, there's yeah. probably more, I'm sure. You well, know, I was thinking usual. about when you said secretor, I think of piece protein for secreting IgA. For yeah, secretory piece, yeah. You think that might play a role in it? Who knows? Well, I, I mean, mucosal immunity is clearly important for yeah. resistance, and that wanes very quickly. Absolutely. So if you happen to be of a genotype where your yeah. mucosal immunity persists a bit longer, you might be. But we yeah. don't really know. Mm -hmm. Uh, they do. Uh, they use this culture system to measure neutralizing antibodies, which is one thing you know you couldn't do this really before. So you can take right. antibodies from people who have been infected, and you can dilute them and and do neutralization assays, which is great. Um, they they show that you can um, use it to uh, uh, measure virus. You can irradiate samples and measure their infectivity. So they say this is good for uh, monitoring disinfection and sanitation procedures, control measures, and so forth. Uh, and so those are basically the experiments. Um, they, they do say in the, um, in the discussion, um, th they mentioned what, what Rich mentioned earlier, that in people who lack B cells, they do get infected. So they say, these our results make sense because there has to be another site of replication besides B cells. 
So they are acknowledging that the virus is replicating in B cells, at least there, although it's a kind of a offhand acknowledgement. But as we said, I think both papers have great merit. They're multiple sites, likely multiple sites of replication. And so um, it's, a, it's, a nice, it's a nice story. I just wish that they had uh, properly acknowledged. The Do we know if there are any carrier states for norovirus? Well, I think these immunosuppressed people, as we mentioned, ah. right? They are, yeah. they are infected for long periods of time, unfortunately. Because you wonder where the source comes from, from some of these uh, outbreaks. Yeah, there are lots of people who are asymptomatic shedders, right? Okay. And they are off, they can be, if they're food handlers, that's a big problem. It would be very interesting to see what their gut tract looks like. In what sense? You take a little biopsy and do an yeah. enteroid culture and see whether or not. Yeah. Uh, By the way, the uh, immunosuppressed patients that they uh, studied in the paper that I referred to were people who had uh, undergone uh, uh, stem cell uh, transplants, uh, oh. uh, bone marrow transplants, basically. Um, right. And so they are uh, artificially immunosuppressed. This is not genetic immunosuppression. Mm-hmm, They're artificially mm-hmm. immunosuppressed so that they can maintain uh, their transplant. And some of these people uh, develop this chronic norovirus infection. Got it. All right. Anything else? Hmm. Well, I, I think it's a good model for studying what the basis for diarrheal disease is, too, because they can look for hypersecretion in these cells once they're infected. They ought to add B cells to these enteroids and, and infect yes. them and see. Yeah. Are both cells infected? Wow. Sure. <laughs> Maybe they can set up a collaboration. Uh, <laughs> would be nice. Is possible. All right. Yeah, there's a lot to do here. That's good. And these yeah. uh, organoid cultures are very cool. Mm-hmm. They are. Very. Uh, I wish I were an organoid. <laughs> at, at what at what point do you think organoids <laughs> will transform into the organ <laughs> and then into the organism? I mean, well, that's sure. already that's already in process. There are yeah. organ on a chip and uh, culture systems that even go even with um, uh, intestinal cells that basically make a little tube like structure on a chip. Very, um, cool. very, and you can you can grow something like a um, like an intestinal microbiome inside it and. Uh, <laughs> huh. Yeah, it's it's very it's it's I very it. very cool. I work. love it. I'm, yeah, I just I have to reverse my age so I can go back and do some stuff. <laughs> if you would like to receive or win a copy of Marilyn Rusink's book "Virus: An Illustrated Guide to 101 Incredible Microbes," the first, which is a really cool book, first person to send an email to twiv at microbe tv with the subject line "I am virus," you'll get a copy. I want to tell you about the other sponsor of this episode, Drobo. What a lovely name. Drobo makes storage arrays that you attach to your PC or Mac via a high-speed interface. And we've talked about before how you can slip multiple hard drives into them. They're all made into one large storage unit. It's redundant storage. It tells you when you have uh, space free or you need to add another drive. And we told you last time about companies that are making apps so that that you can expand the use of your Drobo. You can use your network attached Drobo to uh, backup files to the cloud, which in my view is the ultimate application. You can run a a web server and so forth. And now this time I want to tell you a little bit of of an idea of uh, how the Drobo apps uh, provide secure remote access. So I could have a Drobo here in my lab. Uh, a network attached Drobo, and I could access it securely from all around the world. And the foundation is a app called My Drobo, which performs DNS registration. It, re- it registers a unique URL for your device. It does dynamic DNS management. It keeps the DNS updated with the public IP address of the Drobo. It obtains and installs a 2048-bit SSL certificate, and these are obtained. These certificates are obtained from, any, from a service, a commercial service. Uh, MyDrobo installs them on your Drobo and refreshes them every three months to make sure the data are encrypted on the Drobo before it goes over the Internet. So that protects it from man-in-the-middle attacks or uh, people who are looking to capture your data. How and about finally, Russians? You know, everything is hackable because everything has vulnerabilities. Right, but this would be the idea is to encrypt end-to-end. So if somebody does intercept the data in between, uh, regardless of where they're located, whether it's Moscow or, or Manhattan, um, they wouldn't be able to use it. It would be encrypted. Right. So you refresh it every – you change your certificate every three months. So if, if you somehow mistakenly gave out your certificate to someone, for example, uh, it would get right. refreshed. There's always a, a human element to 
these vulnerabilities. Social engineering. You know, you can have the best encryption, the best sure. security, and someone sends you an email and says, "Hey, click on this link." And you do it, and that's <laughs> yep. the end of your security. That- also, the Drobo communicates with a relay server. The user subdomain resolves to a relay server, which forwards the packets to, Dro- to your Drobo. Uh, this My Drobo is built using open source software that increases its security and probability of being bug free. The DNS and relay is a commercially hosted version of pagekite.net. So, Drobo Access provides remote access to your files from any web browser. So you can be in Moscow <laughs> and you have your Drobo at home and you want right. some files, you go to your web browser. It's a Dropbox-like interface. It's a web page with listing files and folders. It has links for sharing individual files. So if I want to share with Kathy the, some, something for TWIV that's on the Drobo, I can send her a link uh, to the file. You can control links via passwords. You can set a time to expire. You can control uh, read, write, and read-write privileges. You can do version controlling to prevent overwriting a file. There's two-factor authentication available. Uh, and uh, TNO, again, is Drobo Access, is a licensed and branded version of the open source project Own Cloud. So this has been a little geeky today with Drobo, but it just shows you. You can use a Drobo as a simple storage device, or you can get apps and really use it, extend the utility of it. And for me, I'd like to be able to uh, access my files remotely. Of course, right now I use Dropbox for that, but and that's very good. But of course, you may have heard recently that yeah. it was five years ago that Dropbox lost 68 million passwords. They only just announced it recently. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it costs money to use a lot of storage on, dr- on, uh, mm-hmm. on Dropbox. So if you want to uh, roll your own, you should get a, a Drobo and try my Drobo in, in these interesting ways of accessing your data. Twix listeners can save $100 off on their purchase of a Drobo Mini, a Drobo 5D, 5N, or any 8 or 12 drive system. Just go to drobostore.com and use the discount code microbe100. And we are very grateful to Drobo for their support of Twiv. By the way, if you, if you do log into social media or something from Moscow, um, yes. You'll get e- you'll get emails from those accounts saying that they uh, they detected a suspicious login. <laughs> when I was in Japan in Kyoto, they have Kyoto free Wi Fi all over the city, right? Hmm. And so, in order to use it, you have to give them an email address. And my son, who's a computer science guy, said, "Don't give him any your regular email because you'll get bombarded with emails forever." So yeah. he, he makes up fake. Uh, you know, fake accounts that he doesn't use. And it's true. Once you sign up with an email address, then every day you get tons and tons of advertising emails from, on this one account I use, I still get them from Kyoto, right? It's not worth it. (laughs) Not worth it. Let's do a couple of emails. We're doing not badly on time, right? Yep. Yeah, we're, and we're, all right. Uh, we're in, uh, an hour and 15 Got any minutes. more weather things? To, uh, no. <laughs> hour and 15 minutes total, but we didn't start taping until eight minutes in, so we have we have a little bit of time, but not uh, much. Gail writes, please comment on the use of poliovirus while the CDC wants researchers to destroy it. All right, this is a great question. Yes. Uh, poliovirus has been developed for use to treat uh, glio- malignant gliomas at Duke University, and in, in very limited clinical trials, it's had some uh, positive effect. So this has been studied for a long time. It's been developed... In the lab, the virus has been modified to attenuate it in animal models. It had a lot of preclinical study. It then went into a phase one study, and and this is proceeding. And I've always been puzzled by this because, mm, you know, at some point when polio is eradicated, you can't have any polio strains around anymore. So how are they going to use this? Now, these are attenuated, right, but they could always revert, uh, and you know, no matter how much you study them in the lab and say that they don't revert or spread, you never know. Uh, and it just, I, I really don't understand uh, how they're well, going to use this, these, right? Uh, what's, the, what's the modification that makes this oncolytic? Did they replace a chunk of the genome? So the, the, it's, a, it's a Sabin uh, backbone with a 5' prime UTR modified with insertion of some rhinovirus sequences, which attenuates Bad. the virus. But, but, you know, it's a Sabin capsid. Um, it's right. not it's not wild type, which is good, but it's Sabin. But you know, at some point we can't use the Sabin strains any longer. We're, we're transitioning to IPV because the Sabin strains yes. revert. And you know, even though it's hard to get, they inject these viruses, by the way, directly into the tumor intracranially. So right, you know, it's it's not likely they're going to get out. But you would not want one of these to somehow get out. You know, someone sticks themselves in the lab with it, and then you start another outbreak. So I, I, I don't understand how this is going forward. I realize that people with malignant glioma have no other 
choices. Uh, but how can you use this when you want to eradicate This is going polio? forward because the FDA and the CDC aren't talking to each other about it. It could be. I actually don't know the answer. I've, I've thought about this for a long time, and I really don't understand it. So if anyone has any insight. The, yeah, the only thing I can think is that the, the FDA, if they looked at this angle, um, they decided or the company persuaded them, the developers com- persuaded them that um, – uh, that the replacement that they've done with the rhinovirus segment is non-revertible. Like a, it's it's significant enough that this is something that's not going to throw off mutants the way the uh, paralytic mutants, the way the Sabin strain normally does. But that's you know the still, thing is the CDC says after eradication, no viruses with a capsid, no poliovirus with a capsid protein gene are allowed. All right? right. So this is violation of that. If they're going to exactly, make exceptions, right. it doesn't make any sense to me. I right. I, so, you, so uh, after the eradication, you can't even have uh, vaccine strains or anything like that, no, right? You're supposed to get rid of your vaccine strains. In fact, I'm supposed to have gotten rid of type two vaccine strains already. I think so. It was first which wild course, type and then type two. Yeah, which, as we've discussed, you know, that means that you won't be able to manufacture vaccine under any realistic um, yeah. scenario. So, there's a whole problem with that. So, uh, I, I agree, Gail. It's an interesting question. I don't have an answer for you. I'm. I should probably ask someone like Mark Palanch. Um, I'm sure the answer is 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 Alan's answer is that <laughs> well, first of all, you got a problem here because this was developed, uh, been in development for a long time before yes. they necessarily <laughs> anticipated this problem. Uh, but I'm sure Alan's right that probably the thinking is that it's sufficiently attenuated, so it's not going to be a problem. But who knows? All right, um, Rich, can you take that next one? Sure. Wink writes. I am basically a HIVologist and saw my first case of AIDS in 1979. I had no highly active treatment to offer until May 1996, and s- still not all of my patients do well. So please forgive me if I am prone to morbid thoughts. But it occurred to me that I know of three active microbiologic researchers who died of a brain tumor. They are Harold New, Columbia, Stephen Strauss, NIH, and David Finbloom. You may not know of David, but he studied interferon at the FDA, and there is a yearly lecture given in his honor. He was my wife's cousin. Anyway... This is likely a statistically random observation, but then how many such active lab researchers are there? I was wondering if you knew of any other examples. Hmm. Wink. Um, So, I mean, he's saying, does uh, (laughs) research in microbiology cause brain cancer? Um, I doubt it. I'm not even sure. I don't think he's saying Uh, I'm absolutely certain that brain cancer causes (laughs) research in microbiology. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I I was a good friend of Harold News, by the way, and... I went, to too, see, right? I went down to see him about three weeks after his diagnosis when he came back to work. And his first words to me were, you know, I was when I was diagnosed with this, I was hoping that it was one of your beasts. He thought he <laughs> might have had neurocysticercosis, which would have been a treatable thing, of course. And he, he malingered for another two yeah. and a half years. Yeah, and his did. wife really suffered from that. Uh, so did everybody else, including he had Sarah. glioma. Yeah, and it was... But he didn't get the polio treatment. It's very sad. Now, I know a number of microbiologists who have died of pancreatic cancer exactly do you know and you know at least a handful and i was the first virologist you know the thing is i have a friend who's a microbiologist who just had had a sarcoma removed and he said this is because i'm a microbiologist so you know we're all paranoid but but I, i must say uh in the old days a lot of us didn't use gloves or you know, I used to put my hands in ethidium bromide solutions, which now <laughs> is, I've, it's, I've been exonerated because it's not a problem, apparently. But there are other carcinogens that we use. Formaldehyde is a good example. Yeah, but it's not just microbiologists. It's all kinds of scientists that <laughs> sure. would be in contact. So I don't sure. think I don't know of anyone who's done an epidemiological study. Well, X-ray crystallographers are at risk. In the Actually, early days. there was uh, there was a scare like this uh, a couple of decades, twenty or thirty years ago, uh, where. People noticed that a lot of people who had worked on SV40, several individuals who had worked on SV40 died of cancer, in particular colon cancer. And this was uh, actually followed up with a lot of studies (laughs) of their tissues and other tissues to see if uh, they contained SV40 DNA. And uh, in the end, what people, because SV40 for the folks out there, uh, is a cancer-causing virus under particular laboratory conditions, uh, and it's a primate virus. At any rate, 
the bottom line after all these investigations was they could find no evidence that this virus was yeah. uh, causing these. So there are situations where, you know, you see researchers dying of tumors and it makes you wonder. That's one situation where they followed it up and there was no support for the notion that so, their well, and there's, laboratory there's a huge, activities were involved. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, a huge confirmation bias effect here. Um, you know, you notice somebody died of a brain tumor and it's it's significant and you pay attention to that and you notice, hey, somebody else did too. Yeah, that's um, right. that's and right. so you start, you start noticing those and you don't track how many scientists died of heart disease and how many scientists died in car crashes and all the other common things that kill people. Um, so, yeah, you know, everybody dies somehow. And um, uh, cancer is very common. It is. Cancer, <laughs> cancer is fairly common. And if you live long enough, you're going to get it. Um, so I, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in this. Why are you pointing at me, Dick? Because I want to say something. Oh, you, you know. <laughs> uh, Robert Shope died of pancreatic cancer, and so did uh, Peyton Rouse. And they uh, had adjacent laboratories at Rockefeller. So there was the, <laughs> the suspicion that something was up. Uh, with that too, but nobody yeah. ever. But random events cluster. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on. Uh, Alan, can you take Ricardo's? Ricardo writes, hello, two of friends. Here's an idea. Let's hope it happens. The EU has proposed making all publicly funded science papers free by 2020. Goodness. And links to a, to a news article for that. So that's cool. Yeah. It's a great idea. As Alan would say, we got we have to pay for the publications there are costs and i think that there are that uh, plus you know, has the, figured out you know how to do let that the eu pay for that <laughs> the eu well plus <laughs> plus has figured out that plus can survive that's right and i i get into this argument and we touched on it with harold varmus and everybody who's an advocate of plus says look plus proves open access works no plus pr proves that plus works um because what's paying the bills what's keeping the lights on at plus is plus one and there isn't room in the market for a whole lot of PLOS Ones. Mm. By the That's way, saturated. speaking of this, uh, eLife, which is uh, a journal yes. um, recently found, it has been free for a long time. They originally had a lot of money infused by the Wellcome Trust and the HHMI. And now, of course, that's running out. So they've just informed everyone that you're going to have to pay to get your article published. Oh, 2500 bucks per article. Ouch! eLife. So it's not they haven't been able to sustain it. All they did was run off the initial grants, and now yeah. they're yeah. They're, uh, they're out. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And the I didn't think we said it, but the European restriction would only be on things published yeah. in Europe. I mean, the non-restriction right. would only be th on things published in Europe. Uh, uh, so, who are you, Dixon? Can you read the Dixon? Well, <laughs> I can Dixon. try. <laughs> Richard writes. Oh, I might I might want to say this. Is is to Dr. Pride, who was on TWIV at Penn State. Right. Fine. Right. So okay. here, here's the email. Uh, Richard writes, uh, Dr. Pride, I enjoyed your appearance on TWIV this weekend. I am a dentist practicing in Culver City, California, and have been trying to integrate the new information regarding the oral microbiome and virome and put it to use in a clinical setting. I have been trying to keep up with the TWIV and the research and the lectures from the researchers listed below. I forwarded your paper to Dr. Jorgen Slots at USC Dental School. He has a continuing interest in the influence of herpes viruses in the pathogenesis of periodontal disease. He was kind enough to forward some of the knowledge gaps limit. Gaps mm. limit our... Now you skipped something, Dixon. I certainly tend to do that. Thank you for your... <laughs> hey, he was, he was kind enough to forward some of the knowledge ga no. gaps. To forward his recent paper. Oh, is that the line I'm skipping? Okay, fine. Um, I am forwarding it to you. Thanks for your work in this field. I find it uh, helpful and encouraging in that it is filling uh, some of the knowledge gaps limit. That limit our ability, I think. That that limit our ability to treat oral disease. I'm sorry. I, I need to get you a ball. bigger monitor, Dixon. You need to get me I, new... I should have enlarged the type more before. I, I want a brain transplant. Sorry. Thank no, you. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so I, I thought this was interesting because you know, Richard is a is a dentist, and he listens, and he wants to apply what he listens. And no, no, uh, Doctor Pride was interested in, is interested in the oral microbiome and virome, particularly on that episode of Twiv. It was really interesting to hear him talk about it. Yeah. And our other guest was Forrest Rower, who works on right. the microbiome of coral. And it turns out that your mouth and coral 
are very similar. <laughs> Mu- mucus. It's mucus. All about mucus. mucus. It's all about mucus. By the way, I have to mention and mucus and herpes. That Stephanie Karst, her last name Karst means calcium deposits. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a, a thread going out through this. I fr- you know, this paper I linked is not the right one uh, oh, that he sent. I will. Uh, I will link to the right one. Oh, well then, I link yeah. to. I link to one of Doctor Pride's paper, but uh, that's not the right one. Uh, okay, that's one. Re- everyone read something. Kathy, you didn't read, right? So one more. <laughs> I didn't read yet. Yeah. I get Dave's, which is a yes. interesting yeah. kind of stream of consciousness thing. Vincent and Company, Dave the Sheep Shearer from Southern Alberta, Canada, where it's 17C at 8.30 p.m. It got to a high of 29, high clouds and a beautiful day. Couple of items. First, I've been hearing about poliovirus being used on brain tumors. Haven't done any searching about it, but it sounded interesting. Haven't heard you talk about it, but I may be way behind. <laughs> kind of my normal place. <laughs> Second, heard a discussion on CBC, our public broadcaster. I believe the show was the one the 180, where they present opposing views. One scientist held the belief that if a company was paying you to do research, you were <laughs> obligated to find the results they desire. The second scientist said that your obligation was to the science and report it as your results concluded. My wife and I have both worked in research, I as support staff and my wife as a lab tech. When I talked with her about this, she said, yes, if you want your funding to continue, you have to remember who's paying the bills. This scares the hell out of me, and it also gives those who argue against things like vaccinating a lot of ammunition when a scientist can be bought, quotation marks. I realize that it comes down to how you ask a question. If you ask, is this, quote, dangerous, you get one answer. If you ask, if the reward outweighs... The risk, you get a totally different answer. Mm. Dave, mm, thanks for the great show. Good point. Well, in the old I, days, there was a lot of collusion between commerce and science, and um, that's where the suspicion came that everybody was doing it to back up the results that they wanted to hear, like cigarette companies and things right. of the sort. But well, that, that, guess what, Dixon? In the new days, there's Tell a me lot that's of, going uh, on, Alan. I, God, <laughs> tell me. Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think I have not seen it in general, but there might there may be examples. But I, I would say it is not the rule. Would that be fair to say? That We're you, more you aware have, of it. You have to get the results that you're if – you're, if you're funded by NIH, your results are what you get. They're not going to tell you what you should be getting. Uh, of course, if you're working for a company, I I had funding from a company once, and I got results, and they didn't like it, and my my funding ended, but, but I didn't change them so yeah. that they would like them. Well, everybody suspects that clinical trials are like that, right, Alan? Because well, the I drug would, companies are supporting I, Yes. Them. Um, I would argue that if a company is hiring a scientist um, and – and has not – I mean, I would say it's outright corruption if they're hiring you as a quid pro quo. Please stake your credibility on making a false claim. Mm. Uh, that's a different issue. But if they're just um, funding you to do some research, um, my interpretation of that is that the company is hiring a scientist because they want the right answer. Yeah. And so your commitment, not not – you know, to some arbitrary ethic of science, but your commitment as an ethical contractor is to do your job to the best of your ability. You know, if I hire a plumber to fix a leaking sink, I don't want him to come in and and temporarily stop it up and say everything's fine. When in fact, there's some huge problem lurking in the plumbing. I want the plumber to tell me the truth about what's wrong in my pipes. Now I can do with that information what I please. But um, if they're asking for a scientist's perspective then you should give them a scientist's perspective because that's what they paid for. If they don't like that, then there's probably already something in your funding contract that says they're allowed to bury your results if they want, um, more or less, which is something that, yes, Dixon, um, does happen in uh, not just the pharma industry, but in many industries where there's research done. And, for example, ExxonMobil funded research back in the 60s and 70s on whether they – their product was changing the climate, and that research came to the conclusion that it most likely was, and they didn't say anything about that research. No. But they got the honest answer from the scientists. Sure. Um, no, no, I'm totally aware. So, so this is – I think this is um, – whoever the scientist was who said you should tell the company what they want to hear doesn't understand what they've been hired for if they're getting funding from a, from a corporate entity. All right. Let's do some picks. Here, here. 
Dixon, do you have a pick? I do, <laughs> as you well know. Uh, Vincent and I have been working very hard over these last three weeks on a website that I have conceived and uh, resurrected from an older website called Trout Stream Ecology, and it has morphed into the current one called The Living River. And it is an education-based stream ecology um, set of, I guess, <clears throat> breakdowns of the way trout streams behave in terms of the types of rivers that are involved and the kinds of life forms that are found there. And it's filled with pictures, but it's also filled with good science information derived from the standard literature on stream ecology. And we had a lot of fun putting it together, and um, we offer it. Fun. You had a lot of fun. I heard you laughing the whole time. Come on. Um, and it's been put up. It's just about three days old, basically. So I offer it for your perusal and uh, welcome your comments. And I'll say it doesn't have pictures. It has gorgeous pictures. Thank, yeah, it's thank you. This, are this is all, all lovely. Yeah, these are all these my stuff. photographs. These are all my photographs. These are really, really good. Yay. Yeah. Oh, Very, thank you. oh, there's Dixon. <laughs> on the about thing. If yeah. you go to the gallery section, for instance, there's a whole section on wildflowers that I think, uh, <laughs> Kathy, you certainly will enjoy. And I think the others... Yeah, the other guys will oh, too. Yeah. Plus, we have a trout yeah. shop. You can buy you fish. Trout, you can buy <laughs> two books that I've produced <laughs> for the ridiculous price of ninety nine cents for a wade uh, waist deep in water, or two dollars and ninety nine cents. Sounds like a drobo ad for the duets book, which is a series of quotes, famous quotes, plus pictures of flowers. So that's that's what we've done. Waist deep in water is particularly neat. It's your. It's like a. a it's a memoir. It's memoir a memoir of your years of fishing. It's a memoir. Photographs and words. Really yeah. nice. Yeah, and you helped me put that I together. Did. Well, I did. I did so both. Thanks. I helped you put both together. <laughs> all of it. You hated all every minute. I could <laughs> not I could not have done this without you your help. You could pay so. me enough. <laughs> well, this Good is thing gorgeous. I didn't pay you. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, our 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 bluet. Well, tell me about forget that. Forget me nots. <laughs> I don't know. You, I thought they were going to be forget me not. Well, there are four the petal and five petal I, flowers that look very similar. So, uh, if these are not bluets, I would love to know that now because we can still change that label. <laughs> I, I'm not. An I think there are five and four yeah, petal. But they are really beautiful. My, my favorite is the macro invertebrate gallery. Ah, he likes. I that. particularly like stoneflies. Ooh, they're gorgeous. They are actually. Is it about the size of your palm, right? It is. And they have no biting oh, mouth parts, so they're they're totally innocent in terms of uh, being able to handle them and look at them. So would they sit on the water and get eaten by a fish? Well, they hatch, as you can see, on the rocks. Yeah. So they climb out of the water. I see. Uh, but when they mate, they have to lay their eggs back in the water, and that's when they get eaten by the trout. And it's they're cool. huge. Yeah, it's a good sight, Dix, and I, I agree with you. It's <laughs> Thank beautiful. You. Thanks. It's just Thanks. beautiful. It's, you, yeah. you, uh, Enjoy. Vincent, was it hard? Right. Uh, very, uh, yes. Hard? Boy, I had to hold my nose. You know. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't have any uh, magnolias or cherry blossoms. Yeah, they're all, uh, by the way, they're all <laughs> angiosperms, right. by the way. I hate to say this, but. <laughs> I like the pictures of rotting leaves. Yes. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of stuff in this, and uh, we're going to keep adding to it, of course. And I, I want to flesh out, so to speak, the, the Salmonids of the World site. And put real pictures of those fish. Very nice to the words. I, I agree. It's very nice. Fishermen and others who want to know about river ecology should like it. And we know certain virologists that do a lot of fishing, do. don't we, Vincent? Yeah, we do. Like David Baltimore and uh, Irving Weissman. So this buds for you guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lynn Enquist. I should send it to those people. Yeah, I sent it to Baltimore. I should send it to Lynn. You should send it to Chicago also. What's wrong with just one city? <laughs> That's a <laughs> right. bad joke. Alan, what do you have? <laughs> I have a new blog. I think it's a relatively new blog that I came across just recently called Infective Perspective. Um, oh, nice. And it's a, it's a science blog. It's um, infectious disease. Um, what I find cool about it is that it is run by students and postdocs, hmm. uh, ranging from undergrads through postdoctoral. They... Um, uh, you know, seem to have put this thing together and seem to be doing a pretty good job of it. And I would like to encourage that because uh, it's, I, I hope this keeps going. It's uh, the kind of effort since they have a lot of students on it. You know, normally if you see a student science blog started by one student, it's probably not going to last. I know there are exceptions, but usually uh, things get too busy. Uh, this is the kind of thing that might actually persist and I'm um, looking forward to following it. Nice. 
Yeah. They it's very nice. Parasites you, there. That's nice. Good very luck. nice. Good luck. Do you know where this is coming from? I don't exactly. They Their about page is kind of... Um, Pretty generic. Kind of generic. Uh, you know, come write for us and this is what we're doing and please contact us and the contact us is a, is a form. Um, so I don't I know... Guess, I guess I'm. I guess I'm old fashioned. I want people to have a geographic location. Mm-hmm. Yes, but this is like in the cloud. Well, you could find it. Yeah, you probably. could figure it out. Right, very easily. Yep. Okay, thank you, uh, Dixon. What do you have? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Rich, what do you have? Uh, very simple New York Times article. This has shown up on other media sites as well. There has been an asteroid named after Freddie Mercury. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it's called Freddie Mercury. Um, this was actually done by Brian May, who was uh, the guitarist for the rock band Queen, hmm. where Freddie was the uh, lead singer. And uh, since uh, the band disbanded, uh, he's uh, retrained himself as an astrophysicist. And he studies stuff like asteroids. And so he uh, initiated this project to get this particular asteroid named after Freddie Mercury (laughs) on the date where Freddie would have turned 70 years old. And this uh, New York Times article, actually it has a picture of Brian May and Freddie Mm -hmm. in the days when the band was active. And it's got a nice little article and a link to a a video where uh, Brian uh, uh, makes this announcement gets choked up as he does it it's really it's really quite nice at any rate nice go check it out dixon you know who freddie mercury was you bet okay that's how you remember him yeah dun 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 very good do i know freddie mercury kathy what do you have i have a pick that's uh the animation uh, it's computer animation of the destruction of Pompeii by Mount Vesuvius. It's really cool. It starts out in Ooh. the morning and goes through the entire day. And uh, I think it was developed for a museum in Melbourne, Australia. Um, anyway, uh, it's about eight minutes long, and I just loved it. It's cool. Lovely. Very cool. Uh, yes. It reminds me that on our last trip west, uh, my wife and I, when we drove from Oregon up to Seattle, stopped at Mount St. Helens. Have you ever been there? No. Nope. Nope. I, I want to go there. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. They have an observatory uh, that is right uh, opposite uh, where the side of the mountain blew up. That's named after uh, a geologist who was yeah. posted there. Yeah to watch it. I forget uh, his name. Johnson was his last name. Yeah. And it describes what he experienced. Quite different than Pompeii. He was literally blown away in a matter of seconds when this thing blew up. Yeah, it's yeah. quite dramatic. It's worth visiting. At any rate, this uh, video that you came up with is terrific, Kathy. Yeah. Dixon. Yes. I have in my hand a vial of ash from Mount St. Helens. Oh, cool. Oh. I just pulled it I out was, of my drawer. Look at that. I was trout fishing. You pulled it out of your ash. Mount St. Helens ash <laughs> on, written on the side. And uh, yeah. my wife actually went there a long time ago and she collected it and brought it to me. And I still have it. Look I, at that. I was fishing on the Yellowstone River when that happened. And the sky oh. turned weird colors. Oh, bet. And remained that way for many months afterwards. Hmm. Have any of you guys been to Pompeii? Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Pompeii's yeah. great. Very interesting. And I like the food. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, what you, oh, you already told us. Yeah. Is anyone left but me? I'm the one. You're right? the one. You're the guy. You. You're the one. Okay, I have a Wired article about spraying mosquitoes by plane. Ain't perfect, but it's the best we've got for Zika. It's basically an article talking about different ways of controlling mosquitoes, and they mentioned uh, the last Sunday a plane spraying over South Carolina, which unfortunately um, you know, may have killed some honeybees. May or did kill somebody? Do we know that for sure, Dixon? I would no. assume if they used a working insecticide, they would kill some honey yeah. bees and s- yeah. several other genera of. Uh, yeah. So it's, a, insect- it's an interesting issue. You know, you want to limit z- uh, mosquitoes that carry Zika. You, gotta, you have to be careful. You don't hit other things. The beekeepers are not happy. They don't care about Zika. They care about their bees. So this article basically summarizes some alternatives to that and. Uh, I just wanted to mention the, the bee thing, basically, yeah. by citing this one. Yeah. yeah, I think that spraying put a couple of bee, uh, beekeepers in serious, serious trouble. Yeah, it's unfortunate. 
We have two listener picks, one from Ricardo. Hello, Twiv friends. Here's a pick about the origins and importance of the metric system. And he gives a link to a cute YouTube video on why the metric system matters. <laughs> For the majority of recorded human history, units like the weight of a grain or the length of a hand weren't exact and varied from place to place. Now consistent measurements are an integral part of our life. So it's a cool video. And... Um, Ricardo says, as always, it is a lot of fun to assist one of your tertulias, which is a little, a word for like coffee conversation, like a cafe clatch, right? Yeah, kind of like, like a salon. Salon. Ricardo is from Portugal. And Eric Delwart writes, Dear Twiv, the recent pick of the excellent book Darwin's Radio reminded me of another fiction story about emerging viruses. The Giving Plague is a very short story by David Brin, available for free on the web. Gives a link to that. Short story involves plotting murder to steal a mentor's discovery of the Alas virus, acquired lavish altruistic syndrome, <laughs> which induces <laughs> blood donating behavior to spread itself. <laughs> but that's all before a deadly pulmonary prion and a virus brought back by the third Mars mission start to run amok. Oh dear. A great oh dear. 15 minute read. That's very cool. Thank you, Eric. Cool. All right, that's TWIV406. You can find it at iTunes or microbe.tv slash TWIV. A couple of things. Send us your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. Uh, even if you listen to TWIV uh, on uh, things other than iTunes, if you haven't in a long time, go over to iTunes, find the show. It's easy to search for it. And just rate the show. You can give it one to five stars. Please give it five stars. As you know, it's a five-star show. And <laughs> what does that do? It doesn't get us any money. It just gets us more listeners because the more stars, the higher the show is in the iTunes ranking. There are lots of podcasts on iTunes, and people will discover us. We want people to find us because we love talking about viruses. We want people to listen. As you can see, people love learning about these interesting things that just be. There you go. <laughs> and also, consider supporting us so that we can travel and do more shows and do interesting things. Microbe.tv slash contribute will show you all the different ways that you can do that. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Dixon de Palmier is right here at Columbia University, but you can also find him at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Are we done with websites for now? Uh, no, we have one more. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent, at least. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's show, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral. <laughs>